welcome everybody. Um, we have Reverend Todd Tuchia who um, graciously <laughs> offered to give um, opening gosh show. So Reverend Todd, would you lead us in opening gosh show, please? Thank you very much. Please join me in gosh show. Place your palms together. Namo Amidabutsu. Namo Amidabutsu. Namo Amidabutsu. Thank you so much, Reverend Todd. And now we'd like to begin with some introductions of our panelists. Uh, Tiffany Tamaribuchi trained with Seichi Tanaka Sensei and the San Francisco Taiko Dojo, performed with Za Ondeko Za and Zampa Ufujishi Taiko, was a finalist in the first Tokyo International Odaiko Competition and won the All Japan Odaiko Competition in 2002. She developed and led Sacramento Taiko Dan, Jo Daiko, and Tozai Wa Daiko and last year became the artistic director of Portland Taiko. Tiffany has toured across the globe and is in high demand as a guest artist, instructor, and workshop leader. And importantly for us today, she started playing Taiko as a member of the Fukushima Ondo group at the Buddhist Church of Sacramento. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Tiffany. Uh, Isaku Kageyama. Uh, Isaku trained and performed with Amano Jaku in Tokyo and is a two-time national Odaiko champion, becoming the youngest person to win highest, highest honors at the Mount Fuji Odaiko contest in 2000 and Hokkaido in 2003. He has taught at Wellesley College and the University of Connecticut, led after-school programs at the Yokohama International School, the Youth Orchestra of Los Angeles, and Quincy Jones Elementary School, and has recorded for numerous video games and performing, performing artists. Uh, in recent years, Isaku has taught a Bon Daiko class at the Los Angeles Taiko Institute. Uh, welcome, Isaku. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's nice to see your studio, you and your studio. Uh, continuing, and on, yeah, continuing on with introductions, I'd like to introduce um, Kei Fukumoto of Maui Taiko. And Kei founded Maui Taiko as a nonprofit charitable organization in 1996 to perpetuate traditional Japanese folk songs and to, mo to promote taiko. Kei has generously given workshops in Fukushima Ondo throughout the country to spread the love of the song that was brought to Maui by her grandfather. I believe that's correct, right? By your grandfather, Kei? Great grandfather. <laughs> Great grandfather, I'm sorry, another generation. Yeah. Okay. So the group um, carries on the 100 year tradition of playing Fukushima Ondo at Bon Odori and cultural events throughout Maui and continues to elevate their artistry in Taiko with over 30 performances yearly, ranging from community events, corporate engagements and private functions. When our family visited Maui in 2019, we were fortunate to catch an obon with Maui Taiko performing as well as playing Bon Daiko. There was this incredible young man, and he must have been, I don't know, eight or nine years old, um, who could really keep the beat. I mean, he was a great Bondaiko player. And um, thank you, Kay, so much for spreading the love. Thank you for having me today. And our next presenter actually really needs no introduction. Um, Johnny Mori of Kinara Taiko. Um, Kinara Taiko is based in Senshin Buddhist Temple in Los Angeles, and they have their roots in Bondaiko. Okay, as Wikipedia says, um, they began playing Taiko in 1969 when a few um, third generation Sansei um, Japanese Americans gathered after an Obon festival and had an impromptu experience session on an Odaiko. And they are the group who started making taiko out of repurposed nail, excuse me, nail and wine barrels. Um, the first Japanese American Buddhist group um, who contributed extensively, extensively to the development of kumi daiko in North America with their use of the barrels as drums and reached out to and helped develop 
many, many Japanese American Buddhist temple Taiko groups, including the group that I'm in, Stockton Bukyo Taiko. Um, thank you so much. We owe a lot to Kinata Taiko and we, we love what they do. Kinata's informal style of practice and performance is, um, is encouraging to all individuals who wish to join their group, regardless of age or ability. Although they are based in the temple, many of their, uh, and, and many of their longstanding members are Japanese American temple members, all who are willing to play are welcomed. Many groups have had the pleasure of attending workshops and retreats hosted or led and led by Kinata Taiko, as well as attending performances by them. Okay, their willingness to share their songs, as well as their insight into playing Bon Daiko has been appreciated by many. And we are fortunate to get another chance today to um, listen to their, to their insights and their fortune. And, and Johnny, could you tell us a little bit about um, Reverend Moss also? Um, welcome, everybody, and good morning uh, to those in the mainland. Um, I'm not sure if you guys actually, when I looked at the participants, his name is on the list here. So he may oh be God. hearing me talk about him. But anyway, um, he has some uh, medical issues that he dealt with for the last month or so. And um, he's improving, he's getting better uh, day by day. Everything is doing better. Uh, he's up and around, so to speak, and uh, folks at Senshin are uh, helping him out and stuff like that. So uh, he appreciates everybody's concern. Um, probably, hopefully, in a few days, he would be able to go home and stuff like that. But right now, he's still in a rehab facility and uh, getting better day by day. So he would like uh, me to extend uh, thank you to everybody for concern. Uh, but he's progressing and he's getting a lot better right now. So thank you very much. Thank you, Johnny. And our best to River Moss for his recovery. All right. In, in, in addition on. to, yeah, in addition to our panelists, we have uh, special guests. So for decades, Roy and PJ Hirabayashi as co-founder and executive director and charter member and artistic director respectively have been synonymous with San Jose Taiko. As performing members for 38 years, they participated in over 3,500 concerts and events. They have been recognized by the Council General of Japan in San Francisco, JACL, the City of San Jose, and the National Endowment for the Arts Heritage Fellows, uh, the country's highest honor in the arts. They are currently active with artistic teaching and mentoring projects and are the subjects of the documentary film, Because of You, I Am. Thank you again, PJ and Roy, for being here. Thank you, everybody. Great to be here. So before we start our panel discussion, we thought it would be helpful to briefly talk about the history of Bondaiko in the continental US. And we hope Kay will help us out later with Hawaii, which of course has its own rich traditions uh, predating those of the mainland. So. so in the 1930s, Bonodori was introduced to Japanese Buddhist communities in the continental US by Reverend Yoshio Iwanaga Reverend Masao Washioka, and Teruko Naito, wife of Reverend Shozen Naito. At some temples, like Sacramento, Seattle, Guadalupe, and Walnut Grove, singers and instrumentalists played live music for the temple's bonodori. Most communities, however, played records along with or in place of live performances. Temple members and ministers, like Reverend Iwanaga here in Sacramento, would accompany the recorded music on taiko. During World War II, Bonodori was danced in all 10 of the War Relocation Authority concentration camps, as well as some of the temporary detention centers. In Amachi, Frank Koshiro Kumagai and Jutaro Eugene Gondo played atop a tall yagura with a shimedaiko, hyoshige, wooden clappers, 
and a Western bass drum. The Obon in Rower featured drummer Isamu Sam Sugimoto, along with singer Shokichi Morino and drummer George Hiki performing Goshu Ondo. In Manzanar, Bonodori was accompanied by a large taiko on a yagura in the middle of the football field, and innovative craftspeople at the Gila River camp built their own drum using an animal skin stretched over a keg. And as a quick side note, um, as Chris was saying, in the late 1960s, Kinara Taiko independently developed the idea of building taiko out of wine barrels. In the post-war years, Bonodori was an essential part of Obon festivals throughout the continental US. And at most temples, someone from the community would play Bon Daiko for the dancers. In Chicago and later San Diego, it was Isamu Sam Sugimoto. At the Senshin Buddhist Temple, it was Henry Inoue. In San Fernando Valley, it was Kazuo Hombo. And in Sacramento, it was a group of singers and instrumentalists who played Fukushima Ondo, including Harry Nobuyoshi Sato, Kisoji Frank Kobayashi, Katsumi Fred Matsunaga, Kenkichi George Kurosawa, and in later years, Fumio Fred Katayama, Henry Mizushima, Tomio Nojiri, Miyuki Yokogawa, and Tiffany Tamaribuchi. In addition, hundreds of temple members filled the role of a bon drummer through the years, including Stanley Arai in Anaheim, Joe Watanabe in Auburn, Shohei Frank Doi in Fresno, Shigeo Yokoyama in Gardena, Shinkichi Maruki and Minoru Shimizu in Los Angeles, Hideo Al Ito in Monterey and Watsonville, Minoru Harada in New York and Seabrook, Rei Nishikawa in Ogden, Henry Matsunaga in Portland, Shizuka Fukumoto in San Mateo, Shinzui Sanada in Salt Lake City, Toshio Abe in Seattle, Robert Noguchi in Sebastopol, and Ra Randy Yano in Visalia. And as is evident, uh, men were the drummers in these communities. And for many years, women were unconsidered for or discouraged from playing bondaiko. As best as can be determined, Merle Mieko Okada was the first woman in the continental US to play bondaiko on a regular basis, beginning in 1973 at the, at the New York Buddhist Church. She was followed in the 1970s and 80s by Teresa de Kitazano, Jeannie Ishizuka, Wendy Takahisa, and Jennifer Wada in New York, Sharon Koga, Jun Hanano, Anne Takara Saneto, Arlene Takara Santa Maria, Janet Tominaga, and Julia Wong in Anaheim, Phoebe Ogami and Amy Yamada in Gardena, and Tiffany Tamaribuchi in Sacramento. And ever since Reverend Iwanaga drummed for the Buddhist Church of Sacramento, there have been ministers who played Bondaiko, including, of course, Reverend Mas Kodani at the Senshin Buddhist Temple, as well as Reverend Bunyu Fujimura at the West LA Buddhist Temple, Reverend Shuichi Tom Kurai at the Sozenji Buddhist Temple, Reverend Joshin Dennis Fujimoto at the Idaho Oregon Buddhist Temple, and the late Reverend Hiroshi Abiko who co-founded San Jose Taiko in 1973 and played Bone Daiko in Palo Alto, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. And here to pay tribute to Reverend Abiko again are PJ and Roy Hirabayashi. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Um, and it's our pleasure to be able to present a short story about Reverend Hiroshi Abiko. Um, I call him Hiroshi because he's a longtime friend, mentor. He was uh, just an amazing person that really helped us get Tycho started in San Jose. Um, Chris, can you start the slides? We need to go to the top. This is the, not the first slide. Can you begin at the... One more at the top. Okay, here we go. 
So uh, this is Reverend Hiroshi Abiko. I'm sure many of you uh, know him. Um, as like many of the ministers has mentioned, you know, really support Obon. Um, we like to to just talk about Reverend Abiko Hiroshi, and I know, I think Misa is on on here, so maybe she could chime in a little bit too. But um, really, he, he was such an important person for us. This is a picture of him. Uh, I guess kind of a, one of the standard uh, minister pictures. Can we move to the next one? Next slide, please. But this is another picture of uh, Hiroshi when he first started at the Betsuin in San Jose. And this is how I first met him in, in that early time of his. Can we, next picture? So he was in San Jose from 1971 through 83. The next. And during this time, you know, at the beginning, before we, we started the San Jose Taiko, he was the one that really inspired us to think about using the Taiko in different ways. This is actually uh, where you could see him in there, there with, in, uh, I think, like the third person in the middle there. Um, and he brought out his own Taiko to play. This was actually a Mochitsuki early on, but he really enjoyed playing the drum and really inspired us to do this. Next picture, please. So I would like to pass this quote on to you from him. Next picture, please. So he helped start Sounds A Taiko. He's along with Ademio Kusu, myself, Verena Nabiko, really inspired us to begin Taiko in San Jose. This is a picture of the first performance we had with the YBA at the San Jose Buddhist Church in 1973. Next picture. And this is the three of us many years later, um, but we were able to uh, connect with uh, Hiroshi when he had basically retired at this point. And so uh, this is Dean Miyakusa on the right and actually Hiroshi in the middle and myself on the left. Next picture, please. So I just uh, want to show you some pictures of him playing the taiko. This is uh, in our San Jose Taiko, one of our earlier San Jose Taiko studios with our old taiko. Next. He's playing Obon. I believe this might be uh, in, uh, in uh, San Francisco. <clears throat> Next picture. This is probably in Los Angeles where he's playing. Next. Next, please. Next. And of course, Hiroshi was so animated and loved not only to play the taiko, but the dance. And it's really the dance that really was a part of uh, what inspired us too. Next picture, please. And San Francisco a Temple uh, honored him in 2022. And this is a, a flyer that they had put out about him. Next picture, please. And I'll have PJ tell a story about him and uh, helping to name Ajanaika. Um, to do this tribute for Hiroshi is such an honor for us, kind of taking our friendship way back. But there is always something about Hiroshi, as many of you who knew him, he was just full of what Obon is about, the gathering of joy. He would gather us together like before we would start um, dancing Obon, and he would come out as we were also ready to play, and he would lead us and yaddy, 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 sore, 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 and be beating the drum. And that is kind of the energy that he brought um, to everything he did whenever uh, with Taiko. And when it comes to Obon, um, when I was creating Agenica, isn't it good? Um, back at, 
over 25 years ago, I consulted with him. I said, Hiroshi, I want to put together a, a piece that acknowledges our immigrants from Japan, our Issei, and um, really pay, pay tribute to their coming to America. And I would like to call it a Jamaica. And I was influenced and inspired by the a Jamaica, a Jamaica from Shikoku Awa Odori. He goes, oh, the imi, the meaning is like, ah, oh, isn't it good? He goes, that's the literal translation. But really it means like, what the heck? But inside, let's take it a step further. Like it's good, the weather's good. And isn't it wonderful to be around here? And in general, agent is about gratitude. So I consulted with him and I'd just like to acknowledge that the dance that is starting to um, reach many obonodori um, is a Janaika. And I'd like to um, recognize that Reverend Hiroshi Abiko has been a part of that journey. Thank you. Thank you, PJ and Roy. I just want to add that um, <clears throat> as a Dharma school student of Reverend Abiko, I will always remember, remember the Eightfold Noble Path because of him and VT Sklem. Virtue, thought, speech, conduct, livelihood, endeavor, meditation, mindfulness. I think that was it. Okay. So, we thought we would start the panel uh, with a general question for, for anyone. Um, what are your earliest memories of Bondaiko and when did you first play Bondaiko? Um, and maybe I'll ask Tiffany, can you start us off? Sure. Um, my first memories were really were with my mom. Um, and just being there at Obon, mostly in Sacramento. Um, but then as things sort of progress, my, my solid memories are going to uh, driving up to Placer with my bachan uh, every summer. And just, just as a little kid sitting in the car and going and you know, snow cones and ice cream and, and people and lanterns and, um, but really the, 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 the taiko. And uh, my mom said from the time I could walk, I would just stand in front of the drum <laughs> and just the, 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 all I can remember, uh, it's just hearing the sound of that drum and being called to it. And um, so much about going and coming uh, into connection with that part of my culture. Um, yeah, the my earliest memories are just dancing behind my bachan and, and then dancing with my mom and and then standing in front of that drum. I hope that's enough. <laughs> that's great. Thank you, Tiffany. And Isaku? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to quickly say thank you for having me today. Uh, it's an honor to be here with everybody. Um, my my first taiko teacher was uh, Mr. Kenny Endo, uh, and I began taking lessons with him uh, around 1987, when I was about six years old. Um, around some, Sometime around 1989, uh, Kenny moved to Hawaii, and he introduced me to uh, Mr. Yoichi Watanabe of Amano Jaku. Um, my earliest Bondaiko memory is playing at the local festival uh, with Watanabe Sensei's sons. Um, and we were probably uh, seven or eight at the time. Um, I remember uh, my hands uh, getting all blistered. <laughs> um, I remember the, uh, the ice cream. <laughs> 
and uh, and I remember uh, eating squid uh, with my friends. Um, that's my that's my earliest Bondaiko memory. <laughs> that's the bottom is uh, us at seven or eight, and the top is us at maybe thirty seven or thirty eight. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Isaku. Johnny. Yes. Um, growing up at uh, Senshin, uh, I remember Obon from five or six years old. Uh, <clears throat> quite a few people, quite a few friends, so to speak, or, or a large group of folks our age participated in, in Obon. But at that time, we just ran around, you know, had no clue what was going on. Uh, they had games at the same time on Obon, fundraising part of the Obon. And um, Taiko and Obon really didn't hit me until until right when Reverend Moss came, Senshin, which was 68, 69. And um, never paid attention to it, which later on I thought it was great because it didn't necessarily confuse with the dancing or the music that was being played. Uh, we had it, we called it Inoue Sensei, Mr. Henry Inoue. And he was also the uh, principal of the Japanese Japanese school, Japanese language school at Senshin at the time. But every year he would be there and he'd be, it'd be so nonchalant, so, so casual. And, and was there Taiko tonight or was there not Taiko tonight? There was always Taiko, but it was so unassuming and so forgetful that you wouldn't even know it was there, so to speak. So he eventually kind of showed us the different things. But he also asked us to learn how to dance, to know the dances. And that way it would be better for us to try to learn uh, to play along with the music. Um, there's many, many different ways, of course, of playing taiko to obon dancing. And the concept of senshin is to be as non there as possible. But yet, on the other hand, if you're going to do it, make sure you're on beat. And make sure people could, you know, it's not distracting to people dancing and stuff, right? <clears throat> You're in the background, basically. So he always kind of taught us that particular idea and concept and stuff. And of course, after a while, there's this misconception whether or not because of playing taiko, you can play taiko, you can play obon taiko if you play taiko, which is not always the case. It's totally different. It's totally different. Like I said before, you have to know the music. You got to know the dance. So it's different than going in there. Um, part of the interesting issue, since we're covering Taiko, in the early 70s, an individual from Japan came to Southern California and offered to play Taiko at everybody's Obon in Southern California. And this individual came in, and he just played a Matsuri beat to everything. Didn't matter what it was, a Matsuri pattern was played fast, slow, medium, whatever the rhythm of the song was or the dance was. And of course, you know, people didn't have the nerve at the time to ask him to leave the Yagura, so to speak. So there was an issue, and the issue continued for quite a while, and uh, it got to the point where individuals would recognize this person or different temples and ask him not to perform on the Yagara. So there was an issue behind that. And the individual also taught Taiko and he also taught what he played. So there was many people running around here playing Obon Taiko in Southern California that made no sense. So that was our main issue in Southern California. And, you know, we've always come across that problem. And so then it kind of spread. And so people weren't necessarily, they were playing taiko, but they were just playing taiko with no understanding and respect to the dances that were happening or the environment that people were playing in. 
So that was the main issue in Southern California. And it hasn't come across come up as much as before, but there are still individuals who just jump up there and start playing taiko just to be playing taiko. Uh, we try to keep it so that our ego's in check. We don't necessarily play taiko to shine on the Yagara. We're just there to accompany the music and the dance. So that's how we've been kind of teaching everybody and explaining to things. There's different many songs and different many ways to play Obon Taiko. Uh, I totally respect Isaku and Tiffany's way of playing Taiko. They learned the song, they play a Taiko accompaniment to the song and how it was originally. That's great. Because some songs you can't necessarily play accent beats to it while they're dancing. So There's a combination of kind of that stuff like that, you know. I think in my own personal way, accent certain things within the dance. Don't necessarily outshine the dance and play as if, you know, again, you use background music and don't have put your ego out there at all because that's not where this is about. Okay. Thank you, Johnny. We really appreciate your very Buddhist um, you know, attitude about, about playing taiko for Obong. And um, I think we all need to, to um, learn a good lesson from that. Kay, what about Maui and your experience? So this is really hard to try to uh, summarize what, what has happened in Maui. You know, specifically, um, my comments are Maui. Um, the Fukushima Ondo song for Obon was brought over here by the Fukushima immigrants. And they resided in a plantation town called Keahua. And, um, you know, families, Fukushima families put their monies together to, to purchase um, taiko and, and actually bring carpenters from Japan to build the Yagura for Maui. Um, when the plantation camp closed, everything got donated to the Paia Montaguji mission. And so it was there that I got introduced to Fukushima Ondo. My, at that time, my, my great grandfather had already passed, but my grandfather and my father would always get together two months before Obon and they would get together and practice uh, drumming. Um, this particular photo is back in the 1930s and this is um, the Yagura and the Taiko and the group. My grandfather is the one on the ground on the very left standing up. Um, so this was the plantation camp, and this is how the Yagura uh, was erected in the plantation camp for Obon. And then now that that same Yagura is still used today at Paya Montagoji Mission. Um, and very grateful to the craftsmen who are just, you know, continuing to keep keep it going after 100 years. Um, but my yeah, my earlier memories were getting together. My My mom would take my sister and I to Obon practices with my dad. And the men would practice and they would drink beer. I think they drank beer more than they practiced. But <laughs> in any case, it was their get together, you know, a couple months before Obon. In the, one of those breaks where they were drinking, um, I just got up to the drum and I was 10 years old at the time. So this is back in 1970 um, that I got up and I just started playing the patterns. And they re realized, oh, this, you know, this little kid can play. Let's put her up on the Yagura. You know, and which, you know, back in the day, only men played on the Yagura. They were they weren't women. Um, you know, the only um, the only woman that would be, have been allowed is my my grandmother used to sing Fukushima Ondo, so she was allowed to go up there, but she you know she wasn't drumming. Um, so at ten years old, they they allowed me to be up on the Yagura, and my my. Fondest memories are whenever I came back down from the Yagura, there were all these Odori dancers who would give me money because they were so proud that there was someone, you know, maybe I was the woman or, or the girl who was up on the Yagura, right? And, and me with 10 years old with all these older gentlemen, probably in their 40s and 50s. So um, that's my earliest memories. Uh, just Just loving it from, you know, so now for me, it's been 50 plus years that I've been doing Fukushima Ondo. And uh, yeah, at the time, Fukushima Ondo only happened to be played at Paya Montaguji Mission. Um, 
And 25 plus years ago, um, Maui Taiko was formed by my family so that we could continue the music. And we now perform at all the obons here on Maui. Um, and yes, I have tried to um, encourage other, you know, other Taiko groups to take on Fukushima Ondo as a live uh, obon music. You know, nothing like having obon music played live. Um, and here, the tradition, you know, with with the, the recorded music, the reason why so much uh, of the recorded music happened was that here in Hawaii, many of the immigrants came from various prefectures to be brought over to work in the sugar plantations and the you know pineapple plantations also. And so because they came from various prefectures, the bone dances here on in Hawaii were songs from all those prefectures, right? We had Hiroshima, we had um, uh, Dai Tokyo Ondo, we have Kumamoto, you know, various prefectures music were um, integrated within the Obon so that um, we do, you know, Hawaii is unique in that we um, we have Obon music from various prefectures. Going back to old um, Japan and, and and the reflection of you playing one song, like Fukushima Ondo would only be played for hours. It would just be one song at Obon. And still in Fukushima, various towns, that's that's their Obon dance, one song, right? So um, those are my earliest memories. Thank you. Can I add something um, sort of being inspired by what I've seen so far? Um, and to, to speak a little to what Johnny said, my understanding when I bring people into play for, for our version of Fukushima, um, where I, I'm very clear with folks that it, you are here to support the Minyo, you're here to support the dancers. <laughs> it is not about the Taiko. We're not here to be a Taiko group. Um, we're, we're, so, so thank you, Johnny, for saying that. And then just speaking to Merle being the first and then Kay's experience, my other like early earliest member, memories of Taiko were asking, please, can I, can I learn how to do that? Please, will you let me, can I try? And being told over and over again, no, you're a girl. Um, girls don't do this. Well, men play Taiko. Um, and that was for the, the, the Odaiko, the big Taiko. And after years and years and years of asking, um, Tomino, Tomio Nojiji said, yes, you can play. And she handed me a shime and said, take this home and practice. And so I played the, the G kata, the bass rhythm for um, our Fukushima Ondo in Sacramento um, for three months. I just practiced like two, three hours a day. I would just play play that. And finally I, I came in and she said, okay, you can, you can join. And I actually played at Placer first and and then got to play um in sacramento and it was like the 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 most one of the most joyful experiences of my life like finally like you're letting me hit a drum it's not that drum but i get to hit a drum so uh <laughs> that that's a part of my earliest memories and in sacramento too they play a variety of of different bon uh dances from all over and also dances that the instructors want to do uh, the dance teachers there so not necessarily related to any particular area but something that they they feel moved by and uh, our Fukushima in Sacramento is the only is the drum dance is the one dance that the the taiko is playing and Placer is a little bit different because the Minyo, they had Shamisen and, and other singers and and less drumming, actually. So, yeah, earliest, earliest memories. Wow. We love the stories. That's, those are just beautiful. Um, you know, um, you've touched on your memories and your um, the qualities of a good bondaco. I think Johnny really, really hit that on the uh, head. And, and I know that Tiffany and um, Kay really agreed with him. Um, you know, um, and, and then you all talked about when you played, you first played bondaco. So um, the other question that we had was, um, you know, do you have an advice? I know that 
Johnny hit on on what you should be, but what's some specific advice about what what you should do as a born Gaiko player? You know, um, Isaku, do you have any advice on on born Gaiko players? You've you've been instructing people on born Gaiko from um, Asano for for quite a while now, and and um, what do you think? What do you think people should should do? What do you think mm. they should remember? To um, one piece of advice that I've heard uh, over and over again uh, from multiple Bondaiko drummers that I respect, uh, as well as you know from numerous great drummers, uh, you know, kind of genre aside, um, kind of all across the board, uh, is to practice singing the song while you play the drums. Um, and this allows you to do two things. And the first is it allows you to learn the song really well. Um, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it means that it, you kind of start to like uh, digest the song into your musical body. Um, and then the second thing it allows you to do is it allows you to like move through the music with the rest of the band. Um, or the recording, uh, you know, which, whatever the case may be, but it allows you to like really kind of, kind of feel the ebb and flow of, of the music when you sing the song while you play the drums. Um, so that's that's a piece of advice that I've heard um, numerous people say. Um, I suppose also like uh, as a taiko teacher, um, I suppose it's my job to say, you know, like, you know, what. Well, play with good form, you know, stay on beat, so on. Um, but I also think it's important to realize that when you play taiko, as, as people have been saying, you know, to realize that it's a social endeavor in, you know, in addition to it being an artistic endeavor. Um, you're, you're building a community, you're, you're carrying on a legacy, you're sharing culture. Um, it's, it's a connection to the present, you know, as well as to the past and to the future. Uh, so I think it's important to keep that in mind, to learn the dances, to be a part of the community, to, you know, learn the lyrics, where did the song come from, all, all of those things. Um, and I think, you know, the, the drums are part of this bigger picture um, of being a part of a community and sharing and learning and, uh, you know, ultimately finding a path to a happy and meaningful life. Um, yeah, but, uh, you know, if there's one thing, you know, sing the song while you play the drums or practice singing the song while you play the drums. I'm going to echo what Jenny said earlier about uh, the dancing part, too. Um, and in fact, as a taiko teacher, in order to get my students to be better taiko drummers, I'm like, you have to go to Obon. You have to come dance. You have to feel that groove. You, you have to, it, it, That's the thing that's going to make you a better player is listening and dancing and moving and feeling that beat. Um, and even in Ondeko, the other sort of festival thing I do, in, in order to to be a drummer for the Ondeko group, you have to learn the dance first. That you, it all starts from the movement and feeling that beat. And you know when somebody is a good drummer when you're not stumbling through the dance movements. When you're actually there with you and supporting you, and to always remember that that you are there in service of of the music and in service of of the dancers more than and the singers, but in the of the dancers. So, okay, going back to the single digit age outstanding Bondaiko player who was playing in your group. How, how did he pick that up? Was that just a natural kind of thing? Was it just by example? Because all of you are such great examples of what you do. Um, do you teach them exactly what to do? What do you do to get him to what did you do to get him to do that? Okay, I guess, just, I guess we're talking amazing. about my son Mitchell. <laughs> and he was was, that, was that Mitchell? I mean, no, it was it was it was only 2019, so that was definitely not Mitchell. It was just 
was just this little kid, you know, he was, he must have been eight or nine years old. And this is 2019. So Mitchell was not a little kid in 2000. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what's really great about, I think what we do in Maui Taiko is we not only encourage you to learn, obviously the song, but we do encourage everybody to dance. So we unfortunately cannot dance our song <laughs> most of the time, but because I think they learn to dance the other songs, um, I think there's just an inherent, you know, way of, of understanding Obon Taiko music when you're doing that. Um, and I think, you know, as, as, we, as we play it also, um, what's nice in Maui Taiko is that um, a lot of people do it with their family members. So it's the mother with the son or the mother with the daughter. They're getting to do this tradition together, you know, um, and, and attending obons. Um, we used to house a lot of uh, students, um, homestay students from Japan that would come and they would be with us for a week. And I think we did about 15 of those uh, consecutively uh, every year. And undoubtedly, whenever we brought these kids from Japan to Hawaii, and it was during Obon season, we always would take them to Obon. And many of them never even tried a yukata on. You know, I'd be dressing them in yukata for the first time in Hawaii and taking them to an Obon dance. And they said, you know, they would never go to Obon dance in Japan. And here I take them to Obon dance in Hawaii. And they love it. They just enjoy it so much. Um, and in fact, we were asked uh, in 2018 to go back to Fukushima. So there were six of us that went back to Fukushima to play Fukushima Ondo because the towns in Fukushima were not necessarily continuing the Obon tradition and they were trying to restart it up in these towns. Um, and, and over the years, I think, um, just with respect to the Obon tradition, you know, if I kept playing Fukushima Ondo the way we played it 50 years ago, the 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 song was very slow. And what would happen is when we started playing the song, all the young folks would leave the ring and only the older generation would stay. As we picked up the pace, we would always, um, if we play too fast, we would lose the older generation. <laughs> and so we are very mindful of um, how, you know, the timing, right? is to make sure we are hitting the timing um, and the pace of the song so that all generations are comfortable playing, I mean, comfortable dancing it. Um, and so I have tweaked the tradition of Fukushima Ondo, but um, I think because of it though, we've been able to hang on to this tradition. Um, and, you know, obviously last year with what happened um, to Lahaina, we lost three Buddhist temples and we lost four nights of Obon we lost 33% of our Obon on Maui. Um, so of course, Obon um, it, it, and, and remembering, you know, all these traditions from the Lahaina temples, it's even more important for us to keep Obon alive. Um, and, and there are temples that have cut back from two nights of Obon to one night of Obon, right? So um, in order for my tradition of Fukushima Ondo to continue, it's important for us to make sure that the Obons you know, at these temples are strong. Um, so you, some other, you know, what I would suggest is if if you feel that obons in your towns are dwindling, please help, please help the church members to, to get that started again and, and encourage, um, you know, and, and what we did was we started a Maui Matsuri event here on Maui that was a month before obon and it was a way for, um, the community to come to an obon without them feeling like they have to get to a temple because you know here in hawaii obon is not religiously based it everyone of all cultures uh, religions um racial ethnicities they all come out as a community event so um we're just trying to continue the spirit of obon here in maui um and I think the other thing I wanted to mention also is that um, for me, because of where I've, I've come from the traditional side of Obon, I, I've been trying to 
keep some of those traditions of certain songs being played at Obon. What happens is that a lot of times new songs are introduced, but we have to remember that if you only have a two hour time block of Obon, if you put in a new song, you're removing a traditional song. So um, I frankly, when I started to go to the mainland, to the continental US and I, I attended some Obon's and I started seeing some Michael Jackson music at some of them or some, you know, other dances. Um, and that started happening on Maui too. There would be um, the electric slide started to become part of Obon here on Maui. And I, I personally would ask the temples, could you maybe end Obon, just keep your Obon songs together and then add, add electric slide at the end when we're, everyone's cleaning up, you know, and, and so that we can keep the traditional Obon music within the Obon uh, time frame. So that's, that's what I noticed is if, if we don't say anything, um, the tradition may change. And the question is, how much of the tradition do we want to hold on to? Interesting things to think about. Um, so Johnny, I remember when you gave, when um, Kinata gave this, the workshop, led the workshop at a retreat for um, Bukyo Taiko. I remember, I think it was Kodani Sensei who mentioned this about what you should do um, when you play Bondaiko. And um, I think something about, about following feet, the stepping, am I correct? Or was yes. it hands? Uh, mainly the feet. feet. Because okay. the basis of the feet basically is your foundation. And so when you're dancing, you know, it starts from your feet, so to speak. And so uh, if you just jump up there, somebody asks you to play taiko, make sure you, if you don't know the song, watch the dancer's feet. And try to follow that particular rhythm because that's the basis. That's how I look at it, to tell you the truth. I look at their feet mainly. Because uh, the top part is just, you know, embellishing and everything. But basically your, your feet is where uh, I think the foundation starts from. There's many different different ways of how to do that, but again, the basis is is uh, learning to dance yourself and dancing it, so to speak, so something like that. And have fun, <laughs> you know. As much as critical, technically, we we kind of like are 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 doing this and stuff like that. You know, just like you saw, I could say, keep make sure you're on the beat and have fun. You know. Because it goes by. It's just like impermanence. It's there for a hot minute or hot second, and then it's gone. So by the time you figure it out, it's too late. They already did that move. And so you're trying to figure this out, and you're late already. So you're going to miss the next beat, you know? So just have fun, you know? You mess up? Yeah, you mess up. But if they're actually listening to you, and they mess up because you messed up, then they ain't dancing right anyway. They just should be dancing without ego themselves, you know. They shouldn't be singing around listening to you playing, although it does help when you play taiko. Yeah. So keep it simple. Have fun. When what do you think? Shall we move on to the questions from the chat? Sure, we can do that. Um, we have uh, one of the members of the Bonodori Taiko subcommittee, Carrie Wong, has been compiling questions from registration and from the chat. And so I'd like to introduce Carrie uh, to lead our Q&A session. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me today. And um, I'm really looking forward to some of the answers that I'm going to hear that we're going to hear from our panelists. So um, so one from the registration was, what Bonodori song is the most fun for you to perform with?
and this could be anyone. <laughs> Mine is Bono Dori Uta, first song that's usually played, the first song and the last song that we have at Senshi. Simple. Uh, it's hard to play to tell you the truth. <laughs> but once it gets going, you understand it, you know. So that's my that's my favorite. Tiffany, what's your favorite? There's my mute button. I, I think it's always going to be our version of Soma Bonuta or Fukushima Ondo, but I also really like playing just the Shimeda Hanagasa. This is Takadan. Takadan. Um, and it's just something I can chill and groove with. We don't actually, it's been discouraged in Sacramento until very recently to play with the, the, the tape, the canned music. And so we're just starting to do that a little bit. Um, so um, Tonkobushi is another one, I guess. That's kind of fun to play along with. Thank you. My, I guess my answer has to be Fukushima Ondo. <laughs> but um, there's another song that has a lot of taiko in it, Yagi Bushi. And, but it is a very hard song because if you don't, you know, because there's a lot of taiko, if you don't play exactly with the taiko, um, then, then the dancers get off, right? So, um, yeah, but that one's a favorite of mine. Thank you. Isaku? Oh, yeah, Yagibushi is a fun one, um, especially because there are so many different versions of the recordings. Um, so it's kind of a, you're kind of rolling the dice when you show up at the Bonadori and, and they, they play Yagibushi. And it's like, oh, I hope, uh, you know, I hope I know this version of it. Um, especially, you know, the part, ah, 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 like that part, sometimes the beat is like, like, sometimes it's it's on, but sometimes that part, the beat gets super elastic. Um, you know, ah, 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 doom, the, you know, it's like, it's like, where, where, where did that time, time go, you know, um, but uh, also I think uh, Hokkai Bonuta, um, I usually start students off with that one because it's, it's very, um, uh, that introduction, the intro phrase, it, it kind of mirrors the, the basic bon odori patterns, the taiko patterns, uh, don't, 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 it's very like, it, it, it's the same length, uh, it, it kind of, you know, it's, it's good to, to teach them the patterns and then teach them that song, uh, because they kind of go hand in hand, um. Yeah, but all all great great songs. Soma Bonuta is also a great one. Fukushima Ondo, a great one too. Yeah, and uh, Bonodori Uta. Um, I, I I was introduced to that one after I moved to LA, uh, but it's it's become one of my favorites as well. Great, thank you. Uh, so leading into that, um, I noticed that John mentioned that watching the feet, um, really sticking with staying with the beat. We did have a question from the registration. Um, uh, about how do you know how much taiko is appropriate without taking over that song? Can you hear the singers? Can you hear the music? <laughs> if you can't, then it's not appropriate. I can see um, where you get into the music and you're just into it and you just go and, and then you have to kind of step back to uh, say, I'm the support. And so um, thank you. Um, so there, there was a lot of nice pictures about the Yagura, um, old Yaguras from um, different um, uh, churches. And there was a question about the Yagura, um, really the historical sig significance of the Yagura, but also, is there only traditionally one taiko player on the Yagura? No. Because like people... You could have a whole band up there if they fit. You'd have the whole group up there, singers and musicians and everybody up on the Yagura. So I don't think there's any rule about what only having only one person up there. What's interesting about, um, I showed the 1930s Yagura, which we, we are still using today. Um, 
the key is how many people can you put up on a yagura along with the odaiko, along with tushime taiko, and fue people, and a singer, right? And and what's interesting when when we talk about um, tradition, you know, we've always used these 12 inch really thick bachi, and I'm sorry I don't have one, but um, they're short, what I call short stubby sticks. And we, I, I always thought that was so interesting that I would go to these taiko conferences and we would be the only ones with those short stubby sticks. But if you think about it, if you are on a tight yagura with all these people, you know, you cannot be playing those kumi daiko sticks because you'd be hitting hitting people, your, um, your form has to be upright and around the drum. Because if you start doing this, you're going to start hitting the person and the singer. So everything was upright. And, you know, and that's what the form was um, with respect to Fukushimondo too. Um, you know, I've, I've also seen the, the old style. Uh, we have Maui Taiko has taken on a, um, a project of um, remem remembering and um, this song called Futaba Bonguta because Futaba Town um, closed because of the nuclear disaster. Um, they had to close. And so we, they thought that their music was probably going to die because none of the, you know, everyone scattered to various regions. So we took it upon ourselves to learn the song. Um, so we have been very close with the Futaba Bong Uta group, and um, their playing is similar to Fukushima Ondo, where it's it's upright, many people on the yagura, um, and and the bonances in the past were done at, at parks, community centers, you know, not necessarily at temples, um, and so you know, erecting a yagura, it, it became a community event, right? To to bring a festival to your town um, every August. It's always done at a certain time in August. Thank you. Um, wait, so um, the next chat question was, what are some ways teachers and players from different cultures can responsibly and sensitive, sensitively, oh, I'm saying that wrong, sensitively incorporate Bondaiko into our teaching and performance repertoires? That was, that was a lot, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, can you, can you repeat the Sure, I can. Question. Let me make sure I'm reading it right. What are some ways that teachers from or players from different cultures can responsibly and sensitively incorporate Bondaiko into um, our teaching and performing repertoires? Um, go to Obon, <laughs> learn a little bit about the historical and cultural back, uh, context and background around which uh, you know, the piece that you're hoping to incorporate, um, especially if it's a traditional piece from uh, Japan, you, you want to learn the song and learn, you know, the context of it. But if it's something like Eija um, Naika, which is becoming very popular, uh, then you talk to Roy and PJ or San Jose Taiko and, and you you get permission to learn the piece and and and, and learn it well before you start doing it. Uh, performing it on stage. Um, Karen Falkenstrom in uh, Arizona, Odaiko Sonora, loves Obon and actually uh, created a piece called Tucson Ondo and had somebody write lyrics for it and uh, took some of her favorite Bondaiko movements. And I think there's a place for that too, but she approached it from a sincere respect for the culture and a sincere respect for the history history and traditions of Bondaiko and in the heart of sort of recapturing what Obon is and means to people as opposed to, yeah, this sounds really great and I'd like to use this on stage. So I think there's different ways to approach it. I mean, here we are in North America. We are, you know, taiko, for taiko players especially, you know, there's the understanding that what we do is in many ways derivative of Bondaiko and uh, that Buddhist tradition um, and we're also creating something sort of new in our own way. And, you know, certainly, I think talking with people, talking with people in your community, um, learning from someone like Isaku, um, 
there's all these different ways to approach it that will get you to that final result of being able to incorporate the best of what this um, aspect of the tradition and culture and context is as you move forward. Thank you. Uh, so we we have another question about, um, um, and I think, let's see, Kay, no, Kay mentioned that all ethnicities come out and uh, she noticed that modern um, music is played. Uh, I just wanted to get a take of some of your, um, your um, thoughts about the modern songs being played that you're noticing. Uh, what is what is your take on respecting that tradition, making sure that tradition stays there and incorporating those modern day tastes for what the, you know, the crowd may, may want, but keeping that tradition the same? I think, uh, first of all, it's, um, you know, where does the music come from? <clears throat> um, you know, obviously, if you're playing a Michael Jackson piece in Obon, that's not a Obon song. Um, you're just introducing a song that maybe is popular and is becoming popularized. Um, and, and perhaps that particular tempo was trying to gain more um, young, a younger audience, right? We, we have to keep on keeping it fun in order to keep Obon tradition alive. But at the same time, we have actually taken on Maui, there have been several songs, you know, older traditional songs like the Yagibushi um, Tsugaru Jinku that in the past, I mean, seeing this for 50 years in the past, those songs weren't necessarily popular, but they became popular because all of a sudden um, the crowd got into doing kakegoi song, you know, like actually um, call and response for that song, so for certain songs. And because of that, that particular obon dance became popular. So um, for me, it's, you know, where is the music from? Is it coming from... Um, sort of this uh, an Obon tradition, if it is Obon music, um, if it's not Obon music, you know, are the Odori dancers that are helping with Obon, you know, are they um, taking that music and creating the dance for it? Um, you know, unlike Electric Slide, that is not a, an Obon song. Um, so I guess it, it's just trying to include the musical form, the uh, dancing form. Um, you have to remember some of the traditional songs, um, because you're wearing a yukata, you can't be too physically, you know, like jumping around or um, doing some of that, um, different than having a hapi coat on, right? So you have to remember that these songs should be able to be danced, you know, in various uh, outfits. Uh, like that, Hapi and uh, Yukata. I, I think we have to remember what this is about. I Meaning, we're talking about Obon. We're not necessarily talking about the music, the songs, or anything like that. Why are we there? Why are we gathered here as a community? to reflect back on those who passed away within the last year or who passed away. So I love this discussion that we're having about Obon Taiko and all this other stuff, but also too, we have to remember this is Obon. And the reason why we're getting together is to respect and understand and remember those who passed, passed away within the last year. So we still have to make sure we keep that in mind when we do this gathering. All right, we just still have to continue that particular idea of what, why are we getting together? Essentially, we have these lanterns that are hung. At the bottom of the lantern is a person who passed away. It could have been from the beginning of the existence of Senshin, 1937 or whatever. But that's when you look up into the lanterns and you see these names and you understand why you're dancing with all these people while you're out here, you know, having fun, so to speak. So if all those things can be remembered while we're dancing, while we're singing along with these songs, I think is the most important part of why we get together. Thank you, very true, very true. Um, we have about one more 
maybe one more question um, from the chat. It says, how do you view the incorporation of non-traditional instruments, such as Western instruments into Bondaiko? I think uh, non-traditional instruments are in the music, like in the rec pre-recorded music, certainly. And so where um, uh, we just had a, a new minister come to Sacramento and he got up and played uh, bass guitar while we were um, playing taiko this year. He just stepped up. He's just playing the G and, and it and it is something that enlivens, I think, and draws people in. Um, you know, our culture is changing. We're, we're, we're moving forward always. And for Taiko and Bondaiko and the, 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 um, I guess the traditions are that we're carrying forward are also being created as, as they reflect who we are as modern people, as, as people in the community, as people doing this practice. And so I've got nothing against any instrument or any change so long as it sort of is thoughtful uh, and the way johnny said is like you know we're there to memorialize and we're there to it you know celebrate that that you can be a fool and dance or you can be a fool and not dance but you might as well dance so um it I do. I, there was one other question that Stan had put in about what's the difference between mainland and Hawaiian bone traditions. Hawaiian is lit. It's crazy. It's like the most laid back place in my mind because it's very chill and, and tropical. And yet they do the fastest dances and the, the I mean, the craziest call and response stuff. That I, I, you know, I, I wish I had had the opportunity to grow up doing obon the way they do obon in hawaii because i think they're a lot freer in some ways and i know the electric slide and stuff that i mean the addition of these dances i mean it does ref it does reflect the changing our changing demographic and our changing lifestyles and and yet we are creating that bridge to the past and holding what is precious in the in in the traditional songs so just to speak to both of those and i'll, I'll shut up now <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I, you know, thinking of Hawaii and just seeing all the pictures and all what you just said, Tony, I definitely, I think we all kind of want to go now to Hawaii and go join their Obon Festival and their their Bon. Um, it's very different in, in Stockton. We have um, a, a community and uh, people who are doing, who are a bit on the older, um, they're, they're, they're they're in the double digits, farther up in the double digits. And we, you know, want to incorporate that fun in there, but also safety in mind <laughs> with our um, participants. But I would love to go there. I bet we all are thinking we need to go. <laughs> we thank you so much, um, panelists, for your Q&A. And thank you, everybody that's in the chat or did um, something for the registration, a question. We thank you for being really a part of it and asking you, asking your questions. Back to Wynn and Chris. Thank you, Carrie. And uh, I know we're running a little late, uh, but uh, several of our panelists have talked about community building through Taiko and Bondaiko. And I'd love to bring back uh, PJ and Roy here by Ashi to, to ask them to talk about Obon and Taiko and Bondaiko in San Jose. Well, as we mentioned, it was, uh, really, you know, Hiroshi Abiko to help bring us to that. But, you know, we have to also give credit to Kinata, Reverend Moss, Johnny folks, you know, because they also inspired us to really do that too. And um, <clears throat> I think it, what the panel was saying or what everyone was saying is really kind of uh, important to understand and know what we're talking about here. Why Taiko's edible and what, how does it fit in? And what's its purpose? Uh, whether it's the Kubi Daiko side of things or playing with the, uh, with the dance. Um, San Jose Taiko has been trying to work with the San Jose Betsuin to incorporate more, incorporate more of the Taiko back into the Obon dancing. And so uh, it's been a little bit of a challenge, but it's also been very exciting to see that come back and start up. 
Yeah, I'd like to add that Reiko Iwanaga, who has been um, pretty much the uh, Bonodori teacher uh, at San Jose Betsuin um, for many years, but now she, it's a new generation that will be um, guiding. Um, but it was because of, of Reiko who has a lot of dance background and what she felt was missing from San Jose was where's the taiko? We have a taiko group. And she wanted to find a way that the, that the that bonodori actually start to have the sound. So that's how she started to ask San Jose Taiko, is there anything that you can contribute to, you know, um, obon with song? Do you have something? Well, that's when she really welcomed to hear Ajanaika. And also feeling that, wow, what a great story too, that we give recognition to our Issei pioneers. And um, Chidori Band, I have to also give them credit too. They've been playing live music for over 50 years for uh, Obon here. And um, I would say old school, you know, and kind of rebel rousers that we were, <laughs> you know, there, there was a many, many years of just not playing or being able to come to play music together. And it was Reiko that I would like to credit to make that happen. And what has happened is that there is also a new generation of Chidori band that are now uh, collaborating with San Jose Taiko. So you will start to hear more um, Taiko being played with live music with Chidori Band. Thank you, PJ. Thank you, Roy. I know there are other questions <clears throat> in the chat that we didn't get to. So maybe we'll keep the Zoom going um, after we close so people can continue to ask questions or talk story uh, for those who want to stay on, maybe in a more informal kind of way. Uh, but as we end, we'd like to thank Judy Kono, Tyler Moriguchi, <clears throat> excuse me, and Carrie Wong for their administrative help today. Uh, and of course, a special thanks to Kinara Taiko, Maui Taiko, Tiffany Tomaribuchi, Isaku Kageyama, and PJ and Roy Hirabayashi for their stories and valuable insights into Bon Daiko. <clears throat> Uh, if you are interested in supporting programs like this, please see the chat uh, for donations to BCA Music Committee. And on behalf of the bon BCA Music Committee and the Bonodori Taiko Subcommittee, we hope you all have a wonderful and meaningful Obon season. Would you like to add anything, Chris? Again, thank you very much. Um, we really Obo is something that really resonates with all of us, you know, within this, and that's why we're sitting on this committee because we love Obon so much. And um, we were really happy to be able to put on this webinar about Bon Daiko because it connects our Taiko playing with our Obon. And um, it's really important for Taiko players to be reminded that we're not the show, you know, um, during Obon. And so that's, that's, it's always nice to hear that. But to hear all the the traditions and all the the stories behind um, Bondaiko within from Hawaii all the way to continental U.S. that's always nice to know and a, a great reminder of why why we have Obon in this you know with us still and how much it's it's loved and appreciated. So um, um, as as Wynn said, um, we're going to close in a minute and. Um, and please stay on if you'd like to talk story a little bit or ask more questions. But in order to um, to close our our session, um, Reverend Miyamura, would you please do closing gasho, please? Gasho, hands palms together. Thank you, everyone. Namo Ami Damus. Namo Ami Damus. Namo Ami Damus. Namo Ami Damus. Thank you.